All right, uh, why don't we get started? Uh, first of all, welcome everyone to the admitted master students webinar. Um, I hope you are here today uh, because you have either already decided to come to Pan Engineering or you're still figuring this out. Uh, whatever is the case, uh, we're happy to be here to answer all your questions. A brief introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Boon Tao Lu. I'm a faculty member in Computer and Information Science. I'm also very honored to be the Associate Dean for our um, graduate programs in Pan Engineering, where I oversee all of our master's programs and our PhD programs. And today we have a very exciting agenda. Uh, we will have on this call, uh, Elise Edwards, who leads the Graduate Student Affairs. Uh, and we also have representatives uh, across campus to tell you all about Pan, Pan Engineering, and also to answer any questions that you have about joining us. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand this off to Elise Edwards, uh, who is the Director of Graduate Programs, um, to kick this off. Great, thanks, Boone. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, graduate student or master's student uh, webinar. Um, we're happy to have you with us and, um, and to share some information that hopefully will will help uh, entice you if you haven't made your decision yet or provide you with even more background and confirm that you've made the right choice to join us. Um, so I'm just going to briefly go over, touch on some things. Um, I know I see uh, up above, I am joined on the panel by some of my colleagues who work in the program. Um, and a lot of the things that we do in our office, uh, we partner directly with your program. So um, many times I defer to your graduate administrator um, for a lot of, a lot of questions and um, specifics around course information. But let me kick it off or let me get, get into the, the meat of I know what is on many people's minds now that you have decided or are deciding that you're coming. And that is how do you get your courses? When is all that going to happen? So uh, at the moment, we are uh, currently we're wrapping up the spring semester. Um, and once we get through our commencement season, we will turn our focus to you, to our newly admitted students. Um, you should be hearing, if you haven't heard yet, but probably most likely in, in June or early summer, you will hear from your program. That could be your graduate administrator, your faculty advisor, perhaps, um, with information about registering, how to use the Path at Penn system, um, where and how to get your courses. So at the moment, I don't want you to panic if you haven't gotten that information yet. It is coming, trust me, it's on its way in the next couple of months and you will be able to get on to Path at Penn and register for your courses. Um, some things that I noted on the slide, uh, there are many courses that are um, really popular and tend to fill up um, some departments use wait lists. So you might encounter that trying to get a course. Some courses uh, require a permit, which your graduate administrator can give you um, so that you can get the course. Two links that I have included there. Um, one, our handbook, the graduate student handbook, which is chock full of information. Um, at some point, if you have a moment, I will encourage you to go through it. There is a lot in there, but certainly many of the policies, procedures, processes, things that we follow on the graduate side are all housed in that document. Um, additionally, in the handbook, we have a list of our all the graduate programs, the name of the program director or faculty director, as well as the graduate administrator. Um, as I mentioned, I'm just going to point them out really quick. There are, I see three of them on the call today, Stacey Kaplan from DAS, um, Irene Clements from Material Science, and Mary Eileen Griffiths, who is in integrated product design. So they are, again, your first line, the people that you really want to get to know well in terms of course registration, selecting courses, really anything um, that has to do with your, with your program. Oh, Claire, my, I don't, my, my slide is not advancing. Can you, there, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, just some, some dates to kind of keep on your radar. Um, I have links there. Uh, we keep a graduate academic calendar in our handbook. I encourage you to bookmark. We update that calendar regularly. Um, there is also a university calendar, the three-year calendar, um, but which you can follow, but I really 
strongly encourage you to use ours. And that's because sometimes there are certain dates that are specific to the undergraduate population and not the grad population. Um, so just some things kind of put on your radar coming up at the end of August on the 23rd, we will welcome you as a large group uh, at New Student Orientation. Uh, Dean Liu will be there as will many of the people that are on this call today. Um, that is for all new masters and PhD students. Um, you'll also be getting information from your program about a specific program uh, session. But the, on August 23rd in the morning will be our large uh, engineering graduate student orientation. The first day of classes for the fall 2024 semester is August 27th. Um, a big date to, to put on your calendar and it's tentative. Hopefully it'll be locked in soon. That's September 10th. That's the last day you can add and add a class and also drop a class with a full refund. That date comes up really quickly. Once we start, we will remind you about it, but it's a very short window that you have to add classes and, and potentially drop classes. Uh, there's a fall break in the beginning of October. That means there's no classes. Uh, then these dates have not been nailed down by the university, but I put them out there because they're also good to keep in mind. Um, one is it's usually in October, the last day you can completely drop a class with a 50% refund. Uh, usually the end of October, we will open up advanced registration. So already thinking about spring and picking your classes for the spring semester. Uh, no, beginning of November is the last day to withdraw from a class. So that means you are not going to complete a class. That is the very last day you can come out of it, withdraw. Uh, and then before you know it, we get to December, we wrap up last day, December 9th, the semester ends on December 19th. So hard to believe we're already talking about that when we're, we're still so far away. Um, so those are just kind of the real basic things I wanted to put out there today. Um, before I hand it over to my colleague, Jeremy, to talk about international students and scholars. Um, I know we got a lot of questions before the webinar, so I'll just address a couple and also I guess we'll open it up in case you have questions. Um, I think a lot of people, as I said, were really um, wanted to know about registration, how to register. So again, you're going to go to Path at Penn, you're going to get all this information from your program. Um, there were some pretty specific questions. I know people have asked about how can I see a syllabus or can I take an elective or can I take a class in Wharton? And so for things like that, again, I'm gonna point you over to your, your program administrator since all the programs are different. Some programs have you come in and want you to take the core requirements right away, some don't. So those are really specific to the program that you're in. So I'm gonna defer for questions like that to when, when you get in touch with, or you get in touch with your graduate administrator, those are things that you can you can ask them. Um, I'll just there's a couple of specific questions that I'll I'll just real I'll go over very quickly. Um, and that is, so all of the pro master's programs um, do not require uh, a thesis. It's an option. And so if you choose to write a master's thesis, again you'll work specifically with your faculty advisor, with your graduate program administrator. Uh, and choosing a thesis means you will take eight classes and then you will write a master's thesis, which is worth two CUs, two credits um, to complete your degree. So again, if that's something you're interested in doing, I'm gonna defer back to your program, but just keep, keep in mind, it is not required. None of our programs require a thesis. That is an option that you can uh, choose. Um, and then just very quickly at the end, I will, um, I can put the chat, actually, I put the link, I'll put it in the, or we can get it in the chat perhaps, or I can share it. Um, people have asked about career services. We have a robust career services department. Uh, it's led by Jamie Grant, and you will um, be hearing from Jamie and her team. You'll meet them at orientation, and right away, you'll be thrown into all of the wonderful things that they do. Um, no sooner do you get here than we already start with um, employer fairs and all kinds of resources and workshops from career services. So um, I'm not going to touch too much on it because it's not my wheelhouse, but I just wanted people to know that there is indeed, we have a, a really great career services um, team and office, and they are also here to, to support you. So I think that's, that's it for me. Yeah, um, 
Thank you very much, Elise. Uh, I see that there's a number of Q&A questions coming in. Uh, that's wonderful. I, uh, many of us are, are trying to uh, answer the questions uh, uh, as we go. So please keep them coming. Uh, there are two that I would like to answer live together with Elise. The first one is a question on course registrations, uh, uh, whether students can enroll for classes now and what happens if the classes fill up. So Elise, would you like to take that? Um on? And I might even defer to, to Stacey, Irene, or Mary Eileen, if any of you wants to hop on and answer, because you probably know this better than I do. Yes, I believe you you can get on. Your Pass at Penn account um, should be active. Some programs will put an academic advising hold, which means you have to check in with the program. So if you see you have a hold, start with your graduate administrator. Um, but yes, you can technically register right now. Um, Stacey, do you want to, I hate to put you on the spot. Hi. Any, no, hi. that's okay. <laughs> yeah, so specifically for DAT students, um, you're not on an advisor hold, but I would recommend um, waiting until early June when I send onboarding information. If you want to go into Path at Penn and read the instructions, there are many CIS courses that require a wait list, so you can go ahead and request a permit. Um, a lot of decisions aren't made until, you know, midsummer anyway, and we do save seats for incoming students for your, you know, your first semester classes. So don't stress. It's okay. You'll get into your classes. Um, and I would just, I would just wait until June. It's really best that way. Then I can answer questions and I'm all yours and your faculty are all yours. <laughs> yeah, I think that's. Uh, sorry, I was going to say, but I think that's a pretty blanket statement, as we said before, for all the programs. So really best best bet is just to, to give us a few more weeks as we wrap up the spring semester. And then as mm -hmm. Stacey said, our attention is 100% um, on, on you and uh, your programs will be able to give you their attention and to onboard you properly and assist you with registration. Right. Um, and ditto to Stacey. <laughs> <laughs> There is a related question, and I think maybe Irene, you can help us with this. These are students who maybe um, they they are not here yet, but they maybe want to get a head start by taking summer classes. I know material science have some students who have done that, um, taking classes the summer before. Um, yes. What can you hear me? Okay. Yes. 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 One of our um, professors, Dr. Kanta, who is also the master's director, will be offering two summer courses as she has for the last two summers. And when a student is interested, they will need to email Kantha um, to alert her that they're interested in enrolling because then we'll have to change their admit date. We ran into this problem last year. They were trying to register, but in college net, they were listed as starting in the fall. So we had to get that cleared first. And Kantha will approve their registration form, which we use in material science. We have a pre-enrollment form and she signs off and then I will clear the student and they can go ahead and register. But it is done first through Kanta, who is our master's director. And that's the procedure. And after that, what Stacy stated earlier is the um, process that we follow. Great. Uh, thank you, Irene. I'll take one more question live and then we'll hand this off to Jeremy. There's a question asking, student asking about RA positions. When is the best time to apply? Um, the best thing I would say is to focus your first semester on taking classes and getting good grades. And then after that, you can approach the faculty who has taught that class, make sure the faculty knows you, and then you can approach the faculty for either TA or RA positions. Uh, we do hire quite a number of master students as uh, TAs. There are fewer RA positions, but it's still possible to get them. And the key is to identify the faculty early, take their classes, do well, and then approach them. Cool. Um, so I'm going to hand this off to Jeremy, uh, who will tell us about uh, international student and scholar services. All right. Thank, thank you, Boone. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Jeremy Spohr. I'm the Senior Assistant Director of International Student and Scholar Services at Penn. Uh, and I'm also the C's liaison. So I'm kind of the designated representative of between ISSS and C's. Um, and that means that I work with folks like Elise uh, and Dr. Liu to do things like this webinar and to work on uh, programs and helping students with their 
helping their academic aspirations uh, connect with their immigration uh, rules and regulations. Uh, it doesn't mean I advise all the students in engineering, there's far too many of you, but I'm kind of the point person for policies between ISSS and Cs. So uh, my office does two main things for the university. The primary job is uh, immigration services for all of the University of Pennsylvania and our, um, that goes for everyone from high school summer programs up to the faculty to the five hospitals that the university controls. So we have a, a huge job, uh, but we are a group of dedicated professionals that uh, is really here to serve our students and scholars. We also do a lot of integration work to help international students to integrate to Penn's campus. We really want you to feel that you are fully a Penn student and you can participate in all the, um, you know, the campus life and fully feel part of the Penn community. So that's our dual role. We do immigration to help you get here and then integration to really help you feel at home and comfortable at Penn. Okay, Claire, trying to trying to switch. Okay, there we go. Uh, all right, so once you get here, each student will be assigned to an ISSS advisor. Uh, right now, once you get into our IPEN system, you will see who your student specialist is. That's the person that's kind of creating your I-20 or your DS-2019. Once you get here and you're registered, say in late August or early September, then you will be assigned to a specific ISSS advisor that will help you throughout your maybe two years for a master's program, maybe longer if you're a PhD student, and we will help you navigate uh, your immigration needs to be in the US. We offer uh, virtual advising on Zoom uh, five days a week for a few hours a day up spread amongst different advisors. And even as an incoming student, you can make an appointment via our website. Once you have um, at least, if we at least have you in our system, it should allow you to make an appointment to meet with one of us for a 20 minute appointment to discuss immigration questions that you might have. Um, so the main thing that, that we do is we will issue you, now that you've been admitted uh, to Penn, we should have a record of you in our international student database called IPEN, and we will issue you uh, an I-20 document or a DS-2019 if you're going to be a J-1. J-1s are pretty rare, but we do have a few. Uh, the vast majority of you will be F-1. You're going to use that document to, that I-20 to apply for a F-1 visa at the U.S. consulate or embassy in your country or your area of the world. Um, almost all of the interactions that you have with our office that go with documentation are done through IPEN. Uh, and it's a, it's a pretty user-friendly database. You'll kind of have a landing page. You can see your advisor. You can see the different options of what you need and you can request it. Uh, and then we process the documents. Okay, so first step, which hopefully all of you have done or will do in the very near future, is apply for your I-20 in IPEN. Okay, you should have gotten an automatic email from our office that said, you know, welcome to Penn, here is your login, get you in. Then once you give us your passport and your financial documents, we will issue you an I-20. Then you want to make your appointment uh, at your local U.S. Embassy or consulate. Um, we we know that sometimes students experience delays. Uh, if you are delayed uh, for a long time, we we will work with C's if you have to defer. Sometimes students have to defer till January, sometimes even till next year. But we hope that doesn't happen. But it may happen to a small percentage of you. Um, 
But if you're kind of on the normal process, apply for your documents, make your appointment at the U.S. Embassy as soon as you can to obtain your visa, say between now, between May or June and August. And then you're going to be able to get here in late August to begin school with us. Okay, once you arrive in the U.S., you're able to arrive 30 days before your start date on your I-20. So most of you will be arriving August 27th. So any time after, or the, your, I'm sorry, your start date is going to be August 27th. Uh, that's the first day of school. Am I, am I right, Elise? 27th or 28th? 27th. Okay. Uh, so that means you can arrive uh, even in late July. As long as you're within that 30-day window, you can come to the U.S. Once you arrive, you want to do the online arrival e-form in IPEN and let us know that you've arrived. You have to upload things. Uh, you can only do that once you've entered the U.S. So you can't do it from abroad because you have to have an entry record to the U.S. to do this process. So do the online arrival form. ISSS will register you and tell the U.S. government the student has arrived. They're at Penn's campus, you know, and they're either going to class or they're going to start class in a couple of weeks. But this is a normal process. We have thousands of students. They come every August and we have to track every single one of you. So please do the arrival form and it's very smooth. Then we will give you a new I-20 with a travel signature on the second page. Uh, we'll give that back to you probably by in August or early September, hopefully the first half of September, we have everybody registered. That's our goal. Okay. Uh, once you get here, you want to plan on having your registering for your three CUs. That's normal for graduate students. You could take more, but most people take three. Um, you have time to drop and add classes in early morning, September. Good morning. Any uh, there's a date. Uh, Elise had it on one of her slides, but there's a certain cutoff date for drop and add. So you need to have your schedule set uh, with your three CUs. But in that time, you can swap classes. Okay, you can change them. Um, and then ISSS will work with all of the academic units on campus to make sure everybody's here, they've got classes, and then we register you. We say, yep, everybody's here, they're going to class. And that's a process that we have to do uh, in the month of September. And we do it for everybody. We do it in September and January, and then we'll do it again in May for summer session. Summer is easier, of course, because we have a lot fewer students, but September and January, it's very busy. Okay, next. Yeah, next, next slide is just, this is kind of a screenshot of our website. Uh, we have lots of information on there. I'd encourage you to visit our website, take a look at the, the general info, the advising appointments, things like that. Um, and the integration events that we have. I hope to get to meet a lot of you at our fall orientation events that you're all welcome to participate in uh, at various places on campus. I don't know if that schedule is up yet, but it will be on our website. And we always have an extensive uh, variety of things that you can participate in to help you feel at home at Penn and adjust to life at Penn and to the United States. That's our dual role is immigration and integration to campus. Um, here's some more of our social media and stuff that you can see what we're up to on campus. Um, and now I'm sure I'm, I'm out of the corner of my eye. I'm seeing a lot of questions in the chat. So, so let's, let's go back to, let's go back to some of these uh, and I'll see if I can uh, enter. Yeah. So, so Jeremy, do, do you like to take them live or you want to type in the answers? Well, let's let's see if I can answer. I'll try to answer some of them directly. Yeah, yeah. Verbally, and then the other ones I'll type. So let, let me try to just look through here. So, 
Uh, so here's somebody that uh, I'm trying, I went back to the beginning, somebody who's an undergraduate in the US, they're planning to ch do OPT for the summer and then transfer their I-20 to Penn. Um, so if you're, this could apply to many people. If you're in the US, yes, you can do OPT over the summer and then apply for your I-20 now uh, so that we know who you are, but set your transfer release date to come to Penn maybe for August 15th, August 10th, August 20th. So you can work all summer on OPT, then you transfer to us in August, and then you come back to your master's or PhD classes. But you can prepare the stuff now or over the summer, but you don't actually transfer till the end of August. So that's kind of a very uh, a quick transfer question. Uh, there's somebody who's a US citizen, but you reside in India. Uh, no, you don't need to do anything with our office. If you have a US passport, just, uh, just come. Uh, you can certainly participate. Maybe you've grown up in India uh, and you're not used to kind of living in the US. You're, f you're free to participate in any of our integration activities, but we don't need to do an I-20 for you. Sometimes students get confused. They think they can't come to the to the integration events if they have a U.S. passport, but your 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 growing up or your culture may be you may need help to integrate, right? Maybe you didn't grow up in the U.S., so please join us, but don't worry about the immigration docs. Uh, somebody said, "I'm wondering if I need a new visa for U Penn, given that my past visa has expired." Um, Probably not. If you are transferring to us directly, uh, you do not. If that visa, if, if you have a totally new CVS record, you should inquire with the local consulate and ask them if you need a new visa. I will warn you, the US government is inconsistent on the advice they give. Sometimes they say, oh, no new visa needed. Other times they say, yes, you need a new visa. So that's why I can't answer exactly. But we encourage you to check with the local consulate, tell them your situation, and they may say, yes, new visa, or maybe they say, no, you don't need a new visa. But keep a record of their answer because they are inconsistent. Uh, let's see, do people, do people with an existing CVS record still have to do an enrollment? an enrollment form to acquire a new I-20. Uh, I don't quite know what you mean by an enroll. I, you, I'm, I'm not quite sure on that question because don't know what an enrollment form is. So yeah, I, I, I need a little more clarity on what you mean. Like, are you gonna transfer from another school to Penn? Then, then yes, you still have to apply an IPEN and then do the transfer but I'm not sure what you mean. Um, let's see, somebody said, is it okay if my undergraduate school releases my I-20 later than the release date I filled? Um, yes, if they're late, that's okay, but just don't wait until August 27th to try to do it. <laughs> like do it in the middle of August, early August, uh, but it's okay if it's late. Um, how long, how long do I get my I-20 after you apply for it? I think you mean that, how long does it take for us to create it? We usually can process uh, incoming I-20 requests within three weeks. That's our standard. Most of them are two to three weeks it takes for us to produce new I-20s because we're taking in thousands of them, especially right now. Uh, let's see. Am I able to access using? Yeah, if you're, you can use your limited access logon to access IPEN, that's okay, because you might not have a pen key yet. So use the, use the info in the email that we sent you to access IPEN. Uh, somebody said, what are these integration events that I talked about? Well, for example, uh, we have a couple of um, like international student welcome receptions. We have 
a series of workshops called Adjust to Pen Today, where we, these all take place during the orientation week before classes start. Um, and we also have some um, other events such as the Intercultural Leadership Program, which is an off-campus event that you can apply for where we work with about say, I don't know, 50 American students and 50 or 60 or 100 international students and go on kind of an off-campus retreat for a weekend to learn about cultural integration and about, you know, about being a citizen of the world. So a lot of these will be listed on our website under the events and you can sign up for them or attend them. Uh, Somebody said, I'm an international student. If I have to return to my home country in case of an emergency, uh, how long am I allowed to do so? There really isn't a set time, but you would definitely want to talk to like your program coordinator and your ISSS advisor to discuss that. We will help you, but if sometimes if people are out in the middle of the school year, they need to take a leave. They, they, you can't be out indefinitely. Uh, let's see if you're somebody's asking check do i need to check the process if i keep an h1b status while going to a part-time masters um if you are in a part-time masters and you're on h um that is your own business you don't need to check with isss but we cannot advise you other than say you have your own visa status. You should talk to your employer to make sure that they are okay with that, that you are studying on a part-time basis. You cannot study full-time on an H, but you could study, you know, one class a semester or something. It's possible. The I-20s will be sent via PDF. We do not need to mail them anymore. Let's see. You accidentally put the school start date a few days before the actual start date. Um, now that's okay. We'll probably just adjust it for you. <laughs> if you're off by a couple days, we'll just set it to the right one. I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, let's see, here's another. Um, Adwaita Ayer asked about transferring his release date in May so you can get your I-20. Um, yeah, you can do that in May if you want. It's not, you don't have to. It depends what your plans are. You may want to transfer in May after you graduate from your first school, and then we'll make you a new I-20. And then maybe, I don't know, maybe you're out of the U.S. for the summer, and then you come back. That's It depends on what your plans are. Um, but generally, uh, yes, you could do that. Cool. So, Jeremy, um, I think let's uh, move on yeah, to. I better, uh, I, better, I better stop. <laughs> yeah, but, but lots of great questions for international students. I know many of you have questions. Please keep them coming. Jeremy will stay on yeah, the I'll, call. And I'll you. work in the chat. I'll work in the chat now. Cool. So, let's move on to the next part of our presentation. We are delighted to have uh, Linda Cromer. Um, she, she will be. Um, talking to us about uh, off-campus housing. So, um, Claire, would you advance the slide? Uh, Linda, uh, why don't you take it from here? Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Congratulations on your acceptance to a wonderful school at Penn. I know you'll have a great experience. I am the Associate Director for Off-Campus Services, so the Education and Resource Center for the entire Penn community that lives off campus. And as a reminder that all graduate students live off campus. We have no on-campus housing for graduate students. So all of the off-campus students uh, graduate students live off campus. I just put a few little things up, our website, which is very important, and our housing fair, which is open right now. It's open through July. It's virtual, so you can go in there 24-7. There are local landlords, and there's also Penn departments there with plenty of information um, and help for you. The other thing is we do weekly 
information sessions. Those dates are posted on the homepage of our website, right on the first page. Um, coincidentally, there is one today at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, if you're interested, you can certainly reach out to me and I'll send you the link. But if you have any questions that we don't go through, you can certainly email me and I can help you. The housing session that I talked about, the information session, is very concentrated, just housing. We talk about leases and neighborhoods and how to uh, things you should expect. I show people how to use the database. So I think it's helpful. But if you can't attend today's, there's plenty of other ones, May 9th, May 14th, May 23rd, May 29th. But as I say, all those dates are listed on our website so you'll be able to see those i think i have one more slide claire maybe not <laughs> um but anyway i'm gonna go through and keep answering questions for the chat i won't hold a lot of your time because i know you have um questions that you want to ask to your departments but just know i'm here reach out come to an information session and visit the housing fair thanks Thank you very much, Linda. So, Claire, would you like to uh, move on to the next slide? Uh, so, I know many of you are here for um, to get a master's degree for professional training, and at the top of your, your mind would be um, getting jobs. I think that's really important. A um, couple of uh, uh, important things to mention. So, we, we care deeply about your your job prospects, um, whether they are in the US or in other countries. And there are a couple of questions about job statistics. Um, I would encourage you to go to the PAN Career Services website, and you can navigate the website to find engineering master students. And there they have a really nice report on the breakdown of companies that, that hire our students. Um, the one thing that I'm, we are really proud of is that um, an engineering master's degree provides you excellent return on your investment. So uh, we annually do our um, graduation survey and we uh, have very high response rate. In fact, um, in the first six months, we, we know that at least 90% of our graduate students, they are either employed or they continue on to do a PhD degree. And they go into all kinds of industries, whether it's uh, in tech, uh, in uh, in uh, hardware, semiconductor, robotics, consulting, and and so on. Um, and some of our students they uh, stay on in the United States to find jobs. I think for for a lot of international students that um, uh, usually is uh, 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 one of the goals, which is to find a job in the U.S. Um, and uh, we we also have uh, a lot of students uh, who may decide to return to their home countries. That's usually lesser. Uh, but still, um, in terms of job prospects, it's a really uh, wonderful um, uh, kind of a return of your investment. Um, next slide, please. And here are just a list of companies that hire our students. Um, uh, actually, the biggest uh, companies that always hire our students are like uh, Amazon, Meta, Microsoft. Um, in fact, you know, uh, uh, we, we often go out and do alumni events at places like Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and uh, the entire place will be filled with Penn Engineering alums. They, they love to hire our students. Uh, but uh, we also have uh, many other com companies uh, in consulting, uh, in, in, uh, in, in various tech companies that also hire our students. And increasingly, we're also seeing top tech companies. Uh, we, we've seen, for example, Alibaba, Huawei, Five dance, uh, Tencent. Um, I, I just did an alumni event in in Beijing and uh, talked to many alums who who now work in uh, exciting tech jobs, uh, uh, venture capital, even finance, and and the list goes on. Um, and so this is something we care deeply about. Um, in the university, there is a team of excellent career counselors led by Jamie Grant. Um, they provide a lot of um, drop in. Uh, you can talk drop-in advising, and they would come to engineering, and you could meet them, um, and uh, they would tell you all about uh, our um, uh, career services support. They also hold per program, per department um, advising sessions, and they help to re review your resumes and so on. And also within the engineering school, uh, we have our own in-house career 
development professionals uh, led by um, Emily Perry. Um, all of you should keep a lookout for um, people growth. So if you receive an email on um, about getting onto people growth, um, UPenn people growth, just keep in mind, that's not spam. That's a really important platform for you to get on. Um, it's a platform where we connect current students with alumni. And today we have more than 4,000 of our current students and alums on the platform. Through that, you can actually search by industry and you could directly connect to alums who have worked in those companies. And uh, we know cases where students found um, employment opportunities through that. Um, apart from the regular career uh, fair, which actually is round the corner when you come here, um, I think sometime in fall, early fall, will be the in-person and also virtual career fairs. We also have a number of uh, program or team-specific uh, job fairs that you should be aware of. So, for example, there's a data week uh, for data science students. We have a bio fair for biotech, bioengineering students. We have a startup fair. Um, we have semiconductor day where chip companies would come and talk to our students. And throughout the year, there are various info sessions held by recruiters. And the, the pen brand name is very strong. So we, we have no... Uh, no problems getting lots of companies. They want to come here and uh, recruit our students. So definitely keep a lookout for emails and get on Handshake too. So that's a platform you should be aware of. Um, and every Penn student, all of you should have access to that. And through that, you could see all the job opportunities available to our students, whether internships or full-time. Cool. So, um, so that's all that I have. Um, I think in the remaining amount of time, um, we will... Um, we have a good 15 minutes, um, so I will go through the list and we will try to answer as many questions uh, as we can. And uh, our uh, all of us will also be on on the chat uh, typing in uh, answers. Um, and and uh, so so let me let me answer uh, the questions uh, one by one. And while we do that, um, uh, take note of the various. Uh, um, social media platform. Actually, some of you ask, hey, are there ways to find other students? So make sure you get on these platforms. Uh, and uh, it's it's also not too hard to find us. You could go on YouTube, for example, type in Penn Engineering Graduate Admissions, and we have a, a channel with a lot of um, excellent videos and contents. And make sure you subscribe to, to them, um, all of them, uh, uh, while you're on it. So I'm um, going through the chat questions. There, there's a question on, are there opportunities for internships and capstone project with industry in the area of bioengineering. So, here, so here's the good um, part about bioengineering is that uh, we have what we call the bioengineering graduate group, which is not only bioengineering faculty, but also faculty members all across campus who work on anything bio-related. And by that, I mean um, pan medicine faculty clinicians. So many of them um, advise and work with our master students in various topics, uh, including like uh, cancer research, uh, orthopedics. And I know students who also get like um, um, hourly paid jobs there. Um, you could, uh, for instance, do a master's thesis or independent study and be advised um, by a faculty member in, in, in the related um, area over at the med school. Now, um, across the area, uh, one of the really cool parts is um, all the way from King of Prussia to here, there's many uh, bio pharma uh, related companies. And so in fact, in the whole Northeast corridor, there's a lot of um, such uh, companies and they're always recruiting, hiring our students. And um, uh, you should totally check out the bio fair, uh, which is run by career services. I know um, our bioengineering and biotech students find that really helpful to attend. And um, through that, I know some students sometimes find interesting um, industry projects, and they could even do that as a capstone in data science or robotics um, and uh, advised by a faculty member. And in fact, many of us faculty love such opportunities, right? Because, you know, that's also a chance to, to connect with uh, people in the industry. Um, so there is a question on an international students. Do we, we require college degree certificate by August 1st, or is there an option to send it later after we received it? Would that cause any problems in the visa process? Um, so, Jeremy, did you want to take that one? Um, or maybe uh, yeah, at least... I'm sorry, which which one was that, Boone? Uh, it's about college degree certificate. Um, I guess they're asking about 
the official transcript and how that relates to, uh, um, you know, the uh, visa process, right? Would it yeah, call, they I, I, don't, I don't think that's, I, I don't really know what a college, I think they mean their undergraduate degree, I guess, but that's yeah, I, not, that's not really an ISS question. Yeah, would, yeah. would it cause any problem with the visa process? I mean, no, I, I don't think so, but I think it could cause a, an admissions issue because C's admissions is going to require your your undergraduate degree before they're going to admit you. I, I'm not sure if maybe, maybe answer yeah. admissions, answer the first part of that. I, I don't quite follow the question there. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me try to take that. So I think you could go through your I-20, get your F1 visa and arrive on campus with no problems. And that's decoupled from the, the transcript, yeah. official transcript. Yeah. However, if your transcript val verification fails because, you know, for whatever reason, then that will cause your position here to be revoked, right? So, but you got nothing to to worry about if you, you know, you 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 have all the proper documentation, your your transcript verification, and so on. And right. we usually give people sufficient time, even when they are here, to get the information to us. Yeah, that, I I don't think that's really a an immigration factor. It's more of an academic factor to get your undergrad degree confirmed. Indeed, indeed, yep. Um, so the next question is on what percentage of students uh, pursue PhD? I don't have the numbers with me off the top of my head, but I would say that a fair number of our master's students go on to do PhD. It actually varies a bit discipline by discipline. For example, I've seen more of that in material science, chemical bio, molecular engineering, but I've also seen that in, in, uh, in computer science as well. Um, some of them stay on at 10, um, and usually they would be in some lab with some faculty and they continue on in the same lab. And although it's not always the case, but if you continue on doing your PhD at the same university, you likely can finish faster because most of the coursework will transfer over naturally and then you could focus on research. Um, in fact, one of my own PhD students was a master's student who applied, got into a PhD and he finished in three years. Um, and he didn't have to worry about coursework and all he focused on was the thesis work. But that said, we also have a lot of outstanding master students who go on, they apply for PhD elsewhere and they get into another school and we're also very happy and thrilled for them. Um, I don't have the numbers, but I'll say it's a growing number. Uh, what I can tell you is last year and every year we hold this panel, which I help to moderate. We invite a few current PhD students who used to be Penn master student, and those usually have very high turnout. So I know that a lot of uh, master students are interested. And when you're here, um, make sure you attend one of our events where we talk about the process of applying to PhD for a master's students. Um, so the next question is about on-campus centers for entrepreneurship. Um, one thing you should check is um, Venture Lab. So Venture Lab is uh, organized by uh, Wharton and Penn Engineering. In fact, the director for um, um, Venture Lab is a, a Professor Jeffrey Babin, who teaches engineering entrepreneurship in our engineering school. We actually have a fabulous graduate certificate program in engineering entrepreneurship. Um, and I will encourage you to learn more about that. You could um, Google search for pan engineering entrepreneurship and you will find a list of our faculty members. Um, and that said, uh, it's a very vibrant community here. In fact, you look at PitchBook, that ranked the, the uh, company started by undergrads, Penn is way up there, right? We, we have a lot of students um, starting companies. And now there's a lot more resources than say five, 10 years, years ago. Uh, there is Venture Lab. Uh, we have a Penn Center for Innovation. And we, we also run a, a regular uh, Tech Talk series. In fact, last Friday, I was being featured uh, as, as one of the faculty members who have started companies. And we, we invite uh, PhD students, master students to come. And, you know, they ask us all kinds of questions about starting companies, right? So but I'm really glad you asked this uh, as, you know, something we, we care deeply about too. Um, so if you have a handshake account with an undergraduate university, how do you connect to the PAN network? Once you accept our offer, you will have gained access to information that allows you to get the PAN key. With the PAN key, and once you are able to log in, 
you can um, access the Handshake account. Uh, in fact, once you accept our offer, I think you might even start getting emails from us. So if you already made up your mind, then please click accept. And then you can, you know, get the process going on getting the pen key and so on. Um, so next question, Penn has a lot of amazing classes I'm interested in. Am I allowed to take more than 10 CU? Actually, you can take more than 10 if you want, but only 10 count towards your graduation. I know, for example, there are students in, um, in like systems engineering. Um, they want to take some programming classes. Not all of them count towards their graduation, but some of these classes certainly um, boost their opportunities at getting jobs. Then you're more than welcome. To, to take these classes beyond the, the 10, um, which is the limit for master's students. Oh, um, I just want to I just want to add to that. But the only caveat to that is if you are in your if you're in your final classes, like if you're in class nine and ten and you've met the requirements, we have to graduate you. So if you're taking more classes or more than what you need to the degree, you just have to plan it out in a way so so that when you're finishing it in that final class, you've already um, included the extra classes, if that makes sense. But if you've met the requirements and taking taken 10, we do have to graduate you. So at that point, no, you would not be able to, to go beyond and take more classes after that. Yeah, thank you, Elise. That's a really sure. important point. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> no, no, that's good. That's good. That's good. Uh, hey, there's one very important message here. Like, know all your grad coordinators and all the Office of Academic Services advisors. Uh, they actually know, in fact, all, all the policies, sometimes even better than the faculty. So make sure you, when you are here, uh, uh, go through the handbook, but also reach out to them if you have any questions. Um, so there's a question about whether students can get into the classes that they want. Now, um, it, it, at Penn, there is what we call the advanced registration, where students can um, register for classes. Um, advanced registration usually is uh, less, um, it's not really applicable to incoming students because by the time you accept our offer, you will be already be June and so on. Uh, but uh, earlier, you remember uh, Stacy mentioning that there will always be some seats reserved for um, uh, you know incoming students. Um, however, if you don't get into the classes that you need the first semester, it's not the end of the world because many of our most popular classes, they're offered in, in both fall and spring. So if you don't get it in the first time, um, take some other classes first and then um, make sure you try to enroll in them in advanced registration. Um, I think uh, when I look back, um, I don't think there are students who, um, you know, are not able to take the class they like to take in their time here. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about this. Um, so, so there's a question about part, uh, previous class reviews. Um, so you should go on this website called pencoursereview.com. P-E-N-N-C-O-U-R-S-E review.com. Right now, it's behind uh, an authentication wall, so you have to get your pen key first. Uh, but once you get that, you can actually find out uh, all the previous course evaluation. They, if there, there are scores on the faculties. Uh, there are scores on the class itself. There's a uh, rating on how difficult the class is, how much time it takes. Um, uh, so definitely check that out. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if you are a master's student interested to do a PhD, definitely come to our master's to PhD workshop. I run that every year. Uh, we invite a few master's students, former master's students who are now PhD students. Uh, but I would say you don't even have to wait for that event or workshop that I organize. When you're here, talk to the other master's students, talk to your faculty. Many of them have master's students in their labs. And actually, you, you can learn about their experiences as well. Um, so let's see, there's a question on pen cut. Um, okay, somebody's taking that. Um, is there any way to place out of required classes? Okay, so let me try to answer that. So um, if you have um, reasons to think that you have um, taken a class that would count, there are different things you could do. One of them is 
you may be able to transfer classes you have taken as a graduate student elsewhere to Penn, but you would have to fill in some petition form and make sure the instructor here agrees that if the class you have taken is equivalent, then you could transfer those over. But um, you can also, in some cases, waive out of required classes. So for example, in CIT, uh, uh, it's, it's a computer science degree for students with no computer science background. If you, for example, already know programming, you can waive out of the very first class, the intro programming class. And sometimes those faculty members, and this is very case by case, they may have a waiver exam uh, that say, okay, if you take this test, you, you passed it, then fine, you could skip this. Uh, but I would say reach out to your program because those are very program specific. And sometimes the program have to refer you to the faculty uh, to talk about it. Um, so is it common for students to intern abroad during their coursework related to labs? So we have an academic field study program that allows students to work in the industry in the fall semester of their second year. Um, but to my best knowledge, that's primarily for work in the US. Uh, I do know students who go overseas over the summer to do internships. Um, so Elise, do you know anything about uh, do students, can they take time off in fall to, to work overseas? Yeah, um, I, would, I would say, I guess it depends if it's international or domestic, but I guess typically there isn't, um, yeah, there isn't really an internship or study abroad in the master's program. So as, as Boone said, if you're, if you're wanting to do an intern, an internship and it's not here, then really your best bet is to take a leave of absence and go do the, the internship. Um, International students can do CPT or this AFS academic field studies. Those also have um, requirements or criteria that you do have to meet before you can do that. But again, those have to be in the US. But awesome. you can, if, for example, if, if you decide not to do CPT or AFS, for example, in the summer, you know, you're, you're, you're pretty much free for that middle summer, say from May to August. So you can certainly go abroad or go back to your home country for the whole summer and do an internship because sometimes sometimes students do that. They go, well, yeah, I have an internship, but it's in London, right? And they and they go to London for the whole summer and then they come back for their second year. So that's up to you, but you couldn't I you would have to take a leave of absence from like academically if you were to try to do that in during the school year not in the summer and awesome. and re to remind you when when someone takes a leave we will turn off your f1 record so that may interfere with your ability to apply for your post-completion opt or your cpt in the u.s when you take a leave you are out of the u.s and we close your immigration record and you have to apply again to get a new I-20 to return. So in a two-year master's program, it's very difficult to take a leave from and be out of the US. It's very difficult. Got it. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. I, uh, we are now on the hour. So uh, uh, there's additional questions, but feel free to reach out to, to us. Uh, you can go to our website. Uh, reach out to any coordinator or director. We're happy to take your questions. And um, once again, thank you so much to all the attendees uh, all across Penn that came and also to you, the, the student, uh, for, for uh, having the, the faith and giving us an, an opportunity here. Uh, we very much look forward to seeing you here in fall and uh, uh, and have a have a great rest, rest of your summer and, and I will see you at new student orientation. All right, thank you all.